whether the area is under attainment or non-attainment area is based on air quality guidelines and emission or ambient standards. Now, these, if you will look at the table for the NAAQS guideline values for criteria pollutants, these may be, these are taken, the values are taken for a long-term and a short-term value. So, if you are the one doing the sampling, there's, you can see that there is an 8-hour, 12-hour, 24-hour exposure. So, as to determine the amount of criteria pollutant present in the atmosphere. So, there is a particular device being utilized by uh, air laboratories or, or uh, environmental laboratories on air testing for specific uh, criteria pollutant. Now, these standards would be just the same as the standard or have the same standards as that of the water. So you have the US EPA. So, what, if you want to know the uh, sampling methodology as well as the uh, laboratory analysis for each criteria pollutant, you can just Google it. You just type US EPA for a particular criteria pollutant. So, we Philippine Clean, Clean Air Act based it from the US EPA. Okay. And then this ambient air quality could be your basis for planning and management purposes for the protect, protection of public health and welfare. This uh, would also manage attainment and non-attainment areas. Now, for this particular guideline set by RA8749, uh, this uh, actually supports the uh, action of industries to move all their industrial plants far south and far north of from Metro Manila. Because initially industrial plants are located within were located within Metro Manila. So what do you notice nowadays? It's so either they go far Bulacan or far Laguna. This is actually one of the factors that affect their action. Now Governing board to manage the airshed should technically compose of DNR secretary, LGUs, NGOs, POs, and concerned agencies as members. But due to the implementing rules and regulation on this, due to climate change, uh, this would now be managed by DNR, NGO, PO, as well as the owner or proponent. Now, your NAAQS would include the eight criteria pollutants. So, for DSP or PM, you have a certain uh, guideline or values. You also have NOx, SOx, O3, CO, and lead. Now, as mentioned, the guidelines have been set by WHO and are adapted by DOH. Later, I will show you the uh, tables on this. Now, with respect to non-compliance, uh, provision of RA 8749 also includes what a source need to do. So, just in case there is a non-compliance, for example, you're an engineer of a plant and something broke down. For example, your boiler had broken or ha has broken down. What you need to do is as follows. So you will be given two months to plan after notification from the Bureau. So that means you have to report to the DA or BNR what happened. And then you will be given 18 months to comply. And then the Bureau or the DNR or the government will give extension of 12 months for good faith actions from the source owner. Now this is another disadvantage of being in a non-attainment area. If the plan which has a non-compliance is located in a non-attainment area, you will not be given the 12-month grace period. Even if you exert some good faith efforts on solving the problem. But if the plan is located in uh, an attainment area, that's the time you can have this grace period. Okay. To compare the disadvantages and advantages of non-attainment area versus attainment areas, you have as follows. So first, if you are in compliance, uh, 
and at one point you have experienced nonconformity, you will be given the 12 month grace period. And then there is an emission training. However, if you are under non attainment area upon non conformance, and you will be issued with non compliance, no more grace period. Another thing is there will be no emission training. And aside from that, if you are under non attainment area, you will be assessed 50% surcharge on the annual emission fees. That means if company A in attainment area pays 100 peso, pesos, your, not your company B, which is located in a non attainment area, should pay 150 pesos. And fines, just in case uh, due to non compliance, will be given 100% surcharge. That means you have to pay 200% for any penalties or fines relating to a violation. So if you are located in a non-attainment area and supposed to be vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, a company or a plant located in an attainment area, you're supposed to pay, let's say, 500 pesos, you will be charged, what? 1,000 pesos because of 200% surcharge, or 100% surcharge. You mentioned about EQMF. This provision of RA 8749 stipulates that there should be a special account in the National Treasury that is to be uh, administered by the department. Then you will be penalizing the different sources, whether it's mobile or uh, stationary. However, as I have mentioned, this is not yet fully implemented or still under uh, study because uh, the National Treasury is not yet ready to accommodate having such special account because of, as I mentioned, the argument whether where would the fund be taken? Will, will, will it be on the National Treasury or will it be in the budget of LGUs? And also depending on the uh, different roles that each of the agencies would be administering. So for example, if it is a mobile penalty or a mobile source penalty, definitely it should be under the OTC. But if you will put the AQMF under the Department of uh, Environment and Natural Resources, that would, there would be some complications in the withdrawal and uh, managing of the fund. So we still have to wait for this provision. Now, your RA 8749 also encourages CEMS installation. What is CEMS? This refers to Continuous Emission Monitoring System. Now, all owners may install CEMS to determine actual emission rates for purposes of calculating annual emission fees. So as to know what would be the fee, what would be the charge, can they do uh, emission trading, emission offset, etc. Now, the provision states that any company which uh, install a CMS will be given tax incentives, which uh, with CMS industries for those which retrofit their existing facilities with mechanism that reduce pollution. However, uh, this is still not in full implementation, but only those with heavy, uh, only the heavy industries are actually being encouraged to come up with CMS. Heavy industries such as cement manufacturing company and mining. Now, we mentioned a while ago what's a new source. So, if there's a new source, whether it's a newly built establishment or an establishment that is just transferred from one location to another, what should the owner do with the new source? It will be issued, the new source will be issued with temporary permit, but it should not exceed beyond 90 days. The permit is good for a year and it has to be renewed 30 days before expiration date. Now, grounds for suspension would include transferring of permits. So, uh, this is only allowed if the source is sold or transferred. Now, we mentioned a while ago that there are some cases where you undergo non-compliance in industrial plants. 
So what should you do in case there is an operational problem in the plant? So as an engineer, you have to report it within 24 hours of occurrence. You have to submit letter to the NR, and the letter should contain the following. Identification of the cause, your plan or steps to solve the problem, your timeline or the duration of the solution, and your intent of repair. And this has to be submitted to the Bureau or to the NR. Okay. Your ECC, as mentioned, uh, can be revoked at any time of uh, causing imminent threat to public health and to the environment. For example, if your plant has some emission that had caused death, you will be given the cease and disease order. Now what will be taken from you is your ECC or your environmental compliance review. Now, your ECC will only be issued if the EIS submitted would stipulate that there is a financial guarantee mechanism to finance the needs for emergency response, cleanups of rehabilitation, or rehabilitation of area damage. Otherwise, if the reviewer uh, cannot find this in your EIA or in your EIS, you will not be issued an ECC. Now, RA8749 also promotes the usage of available control technologies. So all the technology that we have discussed in our uh, under air can be applied here. So this would include alternative fuels, alternative processes, alternative operating methods, and this should result into the elimination or significant reduction of emissions. So, Specifically, RA 8749 stipulates that existing incinerators should be phased out on or before July 17, 2003. But then again, let us emphasize that some provisions would include, or the provision would include, the exemption of some tertiary hospitals for the on site incinerators for pathological waste classified as biomedical waste. Now, RE8749 also states that all vehicles must undergo inspection in private emission testing centers. Uh, although from the start of the implementation of RE8749, the emission testing was uh, collaborated with government agencies. I think nowadays, uh, if you go and uh, renew your registration for the vehicle, and even, I don't know, even if your, even for your uh, licenses, you have to undergo uh, private emission testing center. Uh, you have to undergo testing of your vehicle. I think it's more on the registration renewal. Now, it's also possible that any uh, authority, such as MMDA, or coming from DNR could have a roadside inspection for suspected violators. So they have this mobile testing machine which they just insert in the muffler to determine whether you have exceeded beyond the limit. And then if so, apprehensions will be given. Okay. Now, uh, with respect to the fuels and additives uh, under Rule 30, of RA8749, uh, this would be the basis of the another law that has been formed, which is, as I mentioned, the Biofuel Act. Now, this is overseen by DOE, and specifications of fuels are stipulated in the Act, and only unleaded gasoline as of December 23,000, 23,000 onwards, all gasoline that should be sold in gasoline stations should be unleaded. Now, with respect to radioactive emissions, uh, this is being governed by another agency, the Philippine Nuclear Research Institute, or the PNRI. Okay, this table shows you the ambient air quality guideline values and standards. So, the method of analysis, as I have mentioned, it's actually based from the USFA method. 
normally the pollutants uh, concentration is uh, reported in ppm or ppb cm is milligram per liter your ppb is microgram per liter Now, this table also shows you pollution from motor vehicles under different categories. Now, normally, the pollution being inspected for vehicles are as follows. Your, your CO, hydrocarbons, and NOx, and then the particulate matter. Now, for cars and light duty, you have this table also that shows you the CO, as well as HC and NOx, depending on the type of vehicles also that are being utilized. Now the standard for light, medium, and heavy duty will also vary. Because as I mentioned, the weight of the vehicle would be directly proportional to the amount of fuel being utilized and therefore this is also directly proportional to the amount of emission of criteria pollutants from each vehicle. Uh, as for the fuels and additives under section 26, the DOE is the one in charge of this uh, with uh, DNR as a co-chair and the fuel as well as the fuel additives to be utilized should also be in consultation with DPS that's the Bureau of Product Standards under DPI or Department of Trade and Industry as well as DOST and the representative